Hi, good evening. Uh, th welcome to Mid-American Gardener. I'm Jennifer Nelson. I'm sitting in for Diane Nolan this evening, and um, I am a blogger, and you can read my articles at groundedandgrowing.co. I'm pretty well a general horticulturalist, and I love houseplants and vegetable gardening, and we've got a great panel of experts here to answer anything that you guys want to throw at us today. We are ready for it. This is our new year, and uh, so let's have at it. And let's start off with uh, Bill here on the end. Yeah, thank you. My name is Bill Erickson. I'm a landscape architect in Champaign, Illinois. And uh, my uh, main interests are in residential landscaping, landscaping for wildlife, um, and uh, water gardening. And um, tonight I've got a question that was uh, sent in to us, and it has to do with uh, gardening for wildlife. It's about uh, a pollinator garden. And these are gardens that have flowers that, that have pollen that butterflies, bees, and beetles and different uh, insects would use, hummingbirds. And uh, they're very helpful for the environment. And uh, this person is wondering when they should cut the pollinator garden down. And I would recommend that they do this in the spring. Uh, don't do it in the fall because you're going to destroy uh, a lot of uh, uh, insect habitat and, and they're overwintering. Um, in the plant debris and so I'd leave it there if your real interest is in uh, the wildlife aspect of it I'd leave it there until spring and uh, the uh, the pollinator gardens are, are actually very easy to um, to construct and to winterize uh, you're basically going with the hardiest of plants preferably native type flowers uh, that would be used uh, in these gardens and they will naturalize and provide a, a very good uh, habitat for, for insects. So uh, I do have uh, an example of, of an insect that would overwinter in the pollinator garden. And um, this is a, um, a goldenrod gall fly. And it's uh, actually uh, laid eggs on the stems of goldenrod, which are a very good pollinator in the late season. And the larvae actually tunnel into the stem and then they secrete uh, a substance that will cause the stem to swell. And the larva will stay inside that gall all winter long. It can even f partially freeze because the larva has a natural antifreeze within the center of it that keeps it alive. What are the um, yeah, <laughs> isn't that amazing? And uh, so it's got a, a protective shell around it, though, for the winter so predators don't get it. Uh, and then in the spring, uh, the, the, the uh, larva will turn into a fly, and it's already pre-tunneled its way uh, out uh, almost to the surface of the gall. You can see a little exit hole here uh, where, where the fly has actually uh, emerged from that gall. And the fly has another amazing uh, attribute. It, it will reach the uh, edge of the gall, and its head will expand and cause this, the skin of that gall to uh, open up and it emerges. So there's some pretty amazing features going on here. Uh, it's a, a good case for uh, intelligent design, I think. So, uh, um, but that's a, a good example of, of creatures that would be in the garden over the winter. And if you're interested in, in the wildlife aspect, uh, wait until spring uh, to cut your garden down. Oh, thanks, Bill. That's really interesting. Who knew we had that kind yeah. of stuff in our backyard? Amazing, yeah. Okay, Marty. Hi, I'm Marty Alanya. I'm a private landscaper here locally in our region. And um, we have a question here <coughs> about a plant that plagues pretty much everybody. <laughs> There's a, do you, I don't, you're going to have a picture here in a minute. Um, this is a, an organic yard. And it is full of bull thistle. These plants, these little seed heads, they look bigger on the screen than they actually are. They're probably only about a quarter inch, half inch long. And they stick in your socks real badly and they drive you crazy. And then when you bring them home from the woods, they grow in your yard. And we all hate them. <laughs> we had a little discrepancy here. We weren't sure if they were annual or if they were biennial. But here's the point. If you've been biting these all last season, Lonnie, you need to remember what they look like and start pulling them in the spring before they ever set seed. Now, since your mom's garden that you're working in is organic, she's probably not going to want you to spray them. 
but here's an alternative if she will let you use something that would kill them like a broad spectrum herbicide then you can paint it on with a little sponge paintbrush if you've got like a little patch of them that's in with your other perennials or things that you don't want to kill you can just dip a little sponge paintbrush in a solution paint it right on that bad boy and say goodbye so that is my suggestion unless you can pull them and like i said if you should if you can id them accurately enough get in there and yank them when they're sm when they're small when they're little you know just big enough to pull out and be sure of course to get the root and then here's a cathartic idea compost them put them in something real hot where they cook up <laughs> and then you can use them later so uh, good luck with that because I'm sure I know they're hard to eradicate thanks Marty uh, Bill might add on that if you can't get rid of a bar of a bull thistles, they make great food for painted lady butterfly caterpillars, and the seeds are fed upon by finches. So uh, you're looking at uh, a couple of different types of wildlife that you can go that way if you fail in getting rid of a bull thistles. Uh, <laughs> so then you meant to do it. <laughs> yeah, so then you can always claim well, it. Those you are made. deliberate. Yeah. Anyway, we have. Uh, a reader who sent in a picture wanting to know if anyone knows what this is. Well, I'm going to take a stab at it. And uh, really, I think that uh, what, is, what is pictured is the, uh, is the egg case of a spider. Uh, this probably has a large number of eggs in that egg case. It appears to be in the, in the mortar of a, uh, of a foundation, and so it's not really all that small. But, the, uh, uh, but that's a... Uh, uh, where, in, where many spiders will overwinter, many will hatch out in the, in the fall of the year, but many go all the way to the spring to hatch out, and so I think that's probably what it is. Which leads me into a very timely sort of thing for this time of year, and people who leave their live Christmas trees up, their cut Christmas trees up too long, uh, at least three or four weeks. In other words, you bought it uh, first weekend after Thanksgiving and you still haven't taken it down. Uh, you're all set for not only a terrible fire hazard because it's now dry as tinder and will go up in a flash, but the other thing is, is you're likely to get spiders hatching out and they will balloon and spin silk and it will look like your whole house, is, whole room is covered with uh, angel hair. And so it's, uh, I've tried to tell people, you know, it's kind of like uh, organic Asian ha angel hair. They don't quite understand <laughs> that or appreciate it, it's but they will, the but season. these little tiny <laughs> spiderlings will, will float here to there. You can also get praying mantises hatched out. I've already had one call this year on that. Uh, and uh, you also get aphids hatched out, particularly if you have a white pine. There's a white pine aphid, <laughs> which will overwinter as eggs, little black eggs along the uh, needles. So the bottom line is after three or four weeks, it needs to go out. Otherwise, things will hatch that are sitting on those trees. It is part of nature, and nature, you brought nature into your house, is likely to show up with it. So not only the spiders like this, these eggs, but also other things can be a problem if you let your Christmas tree become a tinderbox. You know, it's like Sven Gulli having you on here. It really is. Except <laughs> I don't have the eyeshadow. That's true, that's true. <laughs> and no rubber chickens. <laughs> Yet. Thank you, Phil. Uh, my <laughs> husband is watching, and I guarantee you, you've guaranteed we'll never have a real Christmas tree ever at well, our house. Well, you can always you. have one. Just we don't leave it in do. for more than about three <laughs> weeks, and you're fine. You had them at spiders. Uh, as soon as oh you start talking gosh. spiders, there, there will oh never man. be a live Christmas They'll tree. They'll sit at the there and do house. just fine and not hatch if you get yeah. them out before too long. There's a Christmas <laughs> legend about a spider, you know, about the tinsel and all. Okay. okay. Well, to digress in d <laughs> from spiders, we're going to um, answer a question we had um, last sh one of the last shows um, on a mushroom ID. And the question was, a person had this mushroom popping up in their yard uh, just before we had a freeze. It looks like a chocolate dipped morel with an opening at the top that resembles a mouth with lips. Pleasant. Uh, <laughs> it says, do you know what it is? And uh, some folks uh, have done some research uh, and said it is raven stinkhorn mushroom. Nothing harmful, but just rather unappealing oh. to find that in your yard, but do not be alarmed. So next we're going to go to the uh, Did You Know video on broccoli. Broccoli was introduced to the U.S. by Italian immigrants, but did not become popular until the 1920s. 
Okay, we're going to get ready here to go to the phone lines. And it doesn't look like we have any callers at the moment. Okay, we do have a caller on line two about Col Colorado Blue Spruce. Go ahead, caller. Um, thank you for taking my call. <clears throat> I have a Colorado Blue Spruce. It's about nine years old, 15 feet tall. This past fall, it started to lose all the needles on the bottom going almost three-fourths the way up. And then it developed like a white paste on the trunk. I still have the needles about a fourth going up, and I sprayed it three times. And I want to know if that white paste, is that the fungus, or is, is it going to die on me? Should I leave it alone, or what should I do with it? It looks horrible. <laughs> this is probably Cytospora. Uh, one of the uh, characteristics of Cytospora, which is a fungus, is, uh, is it looks like you have very watery... Uh, uh, bird manure running down the, the trunk, which I think is probably the white material that you're seeing. You will get some needle drop associated with it. And although my expertise is not in disease, as, my under, as I remember, uh, the best control for that is to try to keep the plant properly watered and properly fertilized and hope that it will grow as many years as it can before it dies. So I don't believe there's any fungicide or anything that can be used to stop it, I think you, and it normally tends to come in on spruce trees as they start to slow down in growth. Nine years old is a little young. Normally we see them, uh, they, they have a, their, their normal early growth spurt tends to wane a little bit in their mid to late teenage years, usually about 15 to 18 years old. And it's that point at which the cytospora tends to overtake it and kill the tree. So uh, it doesn't sound like it's a real good option for that. But to be sure of what, the, of what uh, my diagnosis is, you might want to take a sample to your local University of Illinois Extension office or send one into the plant clinic and they will be able to tell for sure. Certainly there's no reason to cut the tree down until it dies, but don't, I don't think the outlook is real rosy for that tree. Okay. I could add that spruce in general, uh, we're kind of at the limit of where they can grow successfully. We tend to see a lot of problems with them. It's too warm here in the winter time and too warm, definitely too warm in the summer. Uh, we're going to go to another, continuing on, along on the same line, line three. Carl has another question on blue spruce needle drop. Hi, thanks for the uh, program. Um, my blue spruce is roughly uh, 35 feet tall and the lower third is infected with what I believe is needle drop syndrome. So the question is, can it be saved? And if so, how and when do you decide that it's too late to fix the tree? Bill? Sounds very similar. Yes. Yeah, I, variations on a theme. <laughs> I'm, fungus I'm not really sure. It could be uh, it could be Cytospora again. There's not always a lot of white material on the trunk bark in, in those. Uh, it may also sound, uh, with my limited knowledge, Sneed, which is a uh, oh, which is yeah. a, a die off that's been occurring with spruces. At a 35 foot spruce, you are probably looking at one that's in its late teens to early 20s. Would probably be about right for that for that height. And so it probably, uh, and it is at the point to where some fungal diseases are kind of, kind of catching it up to it. Um, uh, Jennifer made some good comments in that, in that uh, spruces don't do very well here in general. And the one that tends to do the worst is Colorado blue spruce. Mm -hmm. People love them because of the blue color on them, but they are a horrible tree to try <laughs> to keep alive in your yard. Um, you know, generally landscapers try to stay away from that, from Colorado blue spruce. Uh, the Norway spruce or white spruce, I think, are considerably better, isn't that right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so, uh, and so, yeah, everybody likes that blue color, but they're planting a problem. And uh, mm -hmm. so, uh, I would suggest against going out and replacing with 
with, uh, with mm -hmm. other Colorado blue spruce. But uh, it sounds to me like uh, with SNEED, it's a, uh, which I don't remember what the acronym is for, but it's, uh, I think it's called Sudden, sudden Needle, needle something, 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 something Drop. Death or yeah. Drop. Yeah, and so, uh, and so it, is, uh, it is something that, again, I don't believe there's really much in the way of a fungicide to go with it. You try to keep it as healthy as you can. If water it when it's dry, uh, don't water it to death and, uh, and fertilize a little bit. And, it's, uh, and it may continue to grow and, and, and stay ahead of it to a certain extent. But uh, there is no cure that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also some fungal diseases that spread around in the spring. I think rhizosphere is one of them that starts from the bottom up. But remember with any of your evergreens that when you are losing the bottom branches, they're not going to come back. So how long can you live with the tree looking how it looks? That would be a factor, at least in my mind, of whether to take it out or not. Yeah. Um, you could also do what my dad did, which is limit up to the um, height of a car because his got too big for the driveway and so that was his <laughs> solution. <laughs> That's the other common problem I right. see with blue spruce. Nobody reads how big they get yeah. and they yeah. plant yeah. them right next to the house mm -hmm. and then they wonder why right. they've got problems. Why this tree yeah. has a 20 foot spread. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, why they can't get a car in the driveway. Yes. But but the point is 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 like Jennifer said it's, it's very uh, very true and that is there comes a point in which in which that tree that you that you planted that be an asset to your landscape becomes a detriment, and at that point, it's time for for the chainsaw method <laughs> of quality control. Uh, one, cut time pruning. Was, yeah. one cut pruning. One cut pruning. As my old so arboriculture easy. professor said, it's time to prune it at the root. <laughs> so uh, that's uh, that's a factor that's involved, and in, and you will know very well when it's when it ceases to become something that you like to see, <laughs> and where it, it gets to be one that you really hate to to look at, then it really needs to go. Right. And no, for, go ahead. Well, for for windbreaks too, uh, spruces have been used a lot for that, and. And then you um, are disappointed, you know, 15 or 20 years later when they lose their lower branches and start to die. You might want to consider yeah. like a native evergreen like eastern red cedar uh, for a windbreak and uh, go with something that's more rugged or per perhaps a green giant arborvitae, which is a very fast growing arborvitae mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. will reach at least 30 feet tall. Um, and uh, look at some other options. Yeah. And I know. Um, the blue color is not quite as strong on a fir, but I personally have a blue fir in my yard that's probably 30 feet tall. Now they do have a, I didn't shear it like a lot of people like to do and thicken it up. I just, I like the open habit that it has. But it grows right down to the ground, you know, until you break a branch off with the lawnmower. But they do have, an, they have a blue color. They're uh, hardier. They're a lot more adaptable here. So that might be something you want to think about if yours is out in a place where the width, you know, the, f the footprint of the tree isn't an issue and you'd like something large there with some blue color, you might think about a blue fur. Okay. Great points, everyone. Okay, we're going to go back to the phone lines. And Kay on line five has a question on her African violets. Go ahead, Kay. Yes, I, when I bring my African violets home, they're all in bloom. And after they bloom and I take off the dead blooms, then they never bloom again. What am I doing wrong that I can't get them to bloom? Do right. they die or do they just not bloom? No, they don't die. They just, they, they're not vigorous, but they don't die, but they just um, never bloom again. How's the light? Yeah. I've got a grow light over the top of them. Hmm. Fertilizing? Or do you ever fertilize them? Yeah. I do. Yeah, I do. But I only, I don't do it in the winter time too much. And I do it diluted every time I water. You can do it in you the winter time, time winter. also, yeah. Especially um, if you're putting that, that light on them. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I, I just happen to have really great southern exposure windows and eastern exposure. I have a lot of windows in my house. So the southern ones I use in the winter when the, the sun's a little less strong and I can move them to someplace else in the, in the hot part of the, mm -hmm. of the year here. But um, yeah, try to use a... Uh, high phosphorus, a bloom enhancing mm -hmm. uh, houseplant fertilizer. Um, there are fertilizers that are specifically for African violets and if the light is adequate and their feet aren't too wet, they should do really well. I mean, if the health of the plant is obvious in other ways, then it should put on some bloom if, if the sunlight is right. adequate. You should be able to 
see something. I agree. I would look at what you are using for fertilizer and check if it's really high in nitrogen. If you're putting too much nitrogen on the plants, yeah. they'll tend to grow green growth and no flowers. Uh, but definitely, like uh, Marty said, look for something with higher phosphorus. That's going to encourage blooming. And you definitely can f uh, fertilize in the winter as long as you've got lights on them. That's part oh, of the absolutely. reason we don't. Yeah, okay. absolutely. And I'll put in a, a selfless pledge here, uh, <laughs> plug, I should say, uh, and that is... Uh, but my wife is very active in the local Margaret Scott African Violet Club in Urbana. They meet on the first Saturday of the month, which is coming up uh, <laughs> at 1.30 p.m. in the Anita Purvis Nature Center. So if you really want to find out how what to do if you're African Violets, get in a club and they can help you out. Great. Hi, Diggity K, your problems are over. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Great points, you guys. Let's take one more uh, call from Chuck. He's got a question on his Asian pear tree. Uh, yes, uh, I have Asian pear tree that's been very productive the last two years. And this year uh, I had worms in, uh, well, quite a few of the pears, which mm -hmm. I didn't the year okay. before. I was wondering if there's anything, what I should do or if there's anything I can do either now or later uh, to prevent that next year. Uh, you can occasionally get codling moth into pears, which is the worm in the apple. Uh, they will typically lay their eggs at the uh, blossom end, the bottom end of the of the pear. Uh, feed primarily in the uh, in the core, but when they get full grown, they will go out sideways, out through the flesh, and that's where it really messes things up. Pears normally do not get those get codling moth because I think because the internal pressure is typically too high but it may be that your variety of Asian pear is more susceptible than some of the standard uh, American varieties like, like Bartlett or Bosch and some of those, which probably aren't American, but they're grown a lot in the <laughs> U.S. Uh, so at any rate, uh, uh, okay. there, are, uh, there are spray rep recommendations associated with the University of Illinois. It's essentially uh, starting when the, uh, when, when the pears would be approximately a half an inch across and you're looking at, at spraying about every 10 days to two weeks uh, for, uh, for, a cup, for a month and a half or so. And this will help uh, two months, something like that. This will keep them out, but, uh, but it may have been just an anomaly that you had them last year. And I would probably try, try going without spraying and seeing if, if you get them back because it may have just been the year last year was very strong for codling moth. I'm not really certain of that. I'm not a fruit insect entomologist, but, but uh, I would, before I just start spraying, I would, I would look to see if they repeat, okay. particularly since you haven't had the problem in the past. Mm -hmm. Great information, Bill. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna go back to some emails, and Bill, you've got a, a good one with a, a show okay. and tell attached. Sure. Uh, got a question here. Uh, what is the easiest way to start ornamental grass from seed heads? And uh, I guess we were talking about this before the show. The, the question is why? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, uh, the grasses that are, are grown uh, for ornamental use are different than prairie grasses. Uh, they're, they're meant to stay put. And whenever you can grow a, a grass from seed, it means that it won't stay put. <laughs> And um, so that would be the first concern in, in trying to do this from seed. You're, you're going to create an invasive type of, of grass if it grows from seed. Uh, the, the second uh, thing would be that uh, it's probably not going to be true to uh, the, the type of plant that it, uh, it came from. Uh, there's a lot of variability with seeds. And the nice ornamental features that you saw in the original plant may not appear in, in what you're growing from seed. Um, so, uh, and, and usually it's not gonna be as ornamental as, as uh, the original plant was. Uh, there are many ornamental grasses that do not cause a lot of trouble. Uh, Carl Forster is one of the best of the grasses that stays put. Um, some of the switch grasses will rarely reseed like Shenandoah, uh, Heavy Metal and North Wind. And then miscanthus grass, which is uh, the one that I have right here. Um, this is the one that everybody thinks of when they're thinking of um, ornamental grasses that sway in the wind and look nice in the winter. Uh, there are some of these that will recede quite a bit. Usually the green leafed varieties are the ones that, that do it the most. Um, so uh, stay away from some of the original uh, parent uh, plant uh, miscanthus, the sinensis uh, variety. 
Um, but there are some good cultivars that stay put pretty well. Um, candy stripe leafed ones like Cabaret and Dixieland are good. Um, the checkered leaf uh, dwarf zebra grass is a good one. And then there's a giant miscanthus. It's actually called Gigantus uh, miscanthus, and that gets 10 feet tall. That one very rarely reseeds, if at all. So um, I, I wouldn't, uh, bottom line, I wouldn't try ornamental grasses from seed. You're better off to just take a spade, get a little piece of the one you like from your friend's yard. Please don't steal them from the park. Okay. And right. take them home. Yeah. Great information, everybody. And can you believe we're ready to uh, wrap oh it no. up again? We have more stuff. I know. We have so much more to talk about, Especially but it's time to go. Question three there. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, everyone.